and a warm welcome to this UNIDIR event on preparing for success at the fifth review conference of the Chemical Weapons Convention. My name is James Revel. I'm head of the WMD and Space Security program uh, programs at UNIDIR, and I'm really delighted to be able to moderate this event. And thank you for turning up in person and online. I, I should note that this event is being recorded, um, and the recording will be made available online in due course as well. Uh, I, I, there may be more people joining and people leaving, um, so please do come and go as you need to. I, I also understand there is a protest, so some people may have been delayed um, in getting here. A protest, which I should add, is unconnected to this event, I, I sincerely hope. <laughs> And so to provide a little bit of context to set the scene, the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention Review Conference presents an important opportunity to take stock of the past and to chart a course for the future of the Chemical Weapons Convention at what is an important juncture. We're seeing chemistry advancing, converging and diffusing. We're seeing geostrategic relations that are currently strained. And regrettably, we've seen chemical weapons use on multiple occasions over the last decade. This really makes progress at the fifth CWC review conference important. But in order for progress to happen, we need to make sure that there's preparation in terms of development of substantive ideas, but also making sure there's a shared understanding and expectation around how the review conference process works. It is to this end really that we have assembled a report on preparing for success at the fifth CWC review conference, uh, which has been produced by my colleagues over on the other table. The report is intended as a guide for delegates. It provides information on preparations, procedures, documentation, participation in past review conferences. It also provides what we hope is a balanced analysis of some of the salient issues that are likely to emerge at the review conference, as well as some recommendations for consideration by states parties. At this event, we've brought together the authors to elaborate on some of the points in the report but also hopefully have what we, we really hope will be a, an interactive discussion to get questions, comments from, from others as well. Uh, so for this event, we're joined, um, if I can perhaps start with uh, my colleague by the window, Dr. Alexander Gionis. Um, Alexander is a research fellow in chemical and biological security at the Harvard Sussex program based at the Science Policy Research Unit in the University of Sussex. Dr. Gionis completed a PhD on continuity and change in the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons last year and has previously worked in the Technical Secretariat. Next on my list, I have uh, Ms. Maria Garzon Meseda. Uh, Maria is my colleague at UNIDIR and works as an associate researcher. Prior to joining us, she was a policy fellow at the European University Institute, and prior to that, spent a decade in the Argentine Ministry of Foreign Affairs, working on a range of topics, including the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, finally, last but not least, if I could uh, draw your attention to Dr. Alexander Keller. He is the CBW Net Project Leader and network, network Coordinator, as well as a Senior Researcher at the Berlin Office of the Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy at the University of Hamburg. Alexander was formerly a senior policy officer with the OPCW between February 2013 and December 2019, and prior to that worked as a lecturer and a researcher at the universities of Bradford, Belfast and Bath. <clears throat> Before turning to our authors, I'm delighted to offer the floor to Ms. Katrina Mace, a foreign, sorry, foreign and development policy director at the UK Mission to the European Union, and perhaps invite you to provide some opening remarks. So, Katrina, please, the floor and the microphone and the screen. Thanks very much uh, indeed, uh, James. We are very pleased uh, as the UK to have supported the preparation of the UNIDIR report uh, that uh, James has just been speaking about ahead of this, the fifth review conference of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, James has helpfully laid out the rationale for producing the report and the important opportunity that the review conference offers for all states to look back at our collective achievements and, uh, more importantly, to help set the future director, direction for the organisation. As many of you will know, the backdrop to the last review conference in 2018 was a number of instances of chemical weapons use, including in uh, Salisbury in the United Kingdom. There will be some challenging issues this year too, but we remain committed to working constructively towards the RevCon in May. It is really important that we make the most of the review conference process to discuss our respective priorities and come together to reaffirm our commitment to upholding the convention. 
Many of us in the room today and online have been actively contributing to the open-ended working group, and we look forward to those discussions continuing. This unity report brings out some of the key themes 26 years after the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Firstly, it reflects on the challenges and the possible scenarios ahead of us at the review conference. The report considers the consequences of these scenarios and possible um, mitigations. Two, it focuses our attention on reaching a significant milestone, namely achieving the destruction of all declared chemical weapons stockpiles. In this context, we should reflect on how best to implement the verification regime from now on to ensure that we have a regime that is fit for um, the current demands that we face and the current state of the industry and ensure that OPCW Secretariat retains its expertise on chemical weapons and their destruction. And thirdly, the report acknowledges the continued threat of chemical weapons use both by hostile state and non-state actors and the need to ensure that the OPCW remains ready to respond. Underpinning all of this is the need to understand scientific and technological advances of relevance to the convention and help all states fully implement its provisions. I'd like to thank the UNIDIA team and the report's authors for their efforts to promote dialogue on disarmament and security. We hope the report helps inform discussions during the review conference, and I look forward to hearing the discussion um, that will uh, unfold this afternoon as we consider these questions and the report's uh, recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think many of those points that have been raised on challenges, scenarios, verification issues, the use of CW in science and technology, are hopefully some of the things that we can discuss over the course of uh, the next hour and a half or so. With, with that in mind, uh, now uh, that the format for this event is, I'm going to start with some questions from my colleagues, which get into some key bits in the report. Then we really want to turn the, the floor over to you for questions, comments from the audience, both virtually and, and in person. Uh, if you do want to take the floor in person, please do raise your hand and let us know, and we will bring you a microphone for those virtually. Um, there's a a message in the chat here that indicates please submit your questions to the Q&A function and then I can read those out and put those to, to, to my colleagues on the on the other table there. Um, we will try to get to as many questions as we can um, but please do please do bear with us. Um, I should also note this is quite important for us that all the panelists are speaking in their personal capacity so their views are not necessarily um, representative of UNIDIR or the wider UN system. Uh, we, we, of course, don't expect everybody to agree with what our panellists say, but we hope we can at least stimulate thinking around the topic. Okay, with that in mind, i uh, proceed to our first question. I'm actually going to put this to um, Dr. Gionis. So perhaps I can start with a question for you, and perhaps you could uh, build on some of the points that Katrina raised in terms of setting the scene and providing an overview of the context in which this review conference is taking place. You have the floor and screen, Alex. Um, thank you, Jamie, and uh, well, lovely to see everyone. It's nice to be here in Brussels, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, yeah, in terms of the context of this review conference, I guess there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Um, I think the geostrategic environment is something that we're probably all very aware of, so I don't need to go into too much detail on that, but it's been dominated certainly in the last year by, by the fallout of the war in Ukraine. Um, other international fora, um, have obviously felt the effects of this. Um, Antonio Guterres said that uh, in December that we were sort of in a, a bleak international security environment. Um, and I think this kind of meta political security environment will condition to varying degrees what happens. Um, it's hard to predict. Obviously, there were some glimmer of hopes from the Biological Weapons Convention Review Conference, but we've also seen in other areas um, more challenges uh, emerging. So it, it's hard to sort of look at this with a lot of optimism but um I, I guess we need to keep a glimmer of hope perhaps um another context is the organizational ones so are looking more specifically at the opcw and as was mentioned just just previously um the end of routine verification of destruction of declared chemical weapon stockpiles is is coming to an end i think in september when the united states finishes um their destruction activities um so certainly there's a big question around functional rebalancing of the organization so you know what next what what do we actually do and that implicates questions around the skills and expertise um to use a phrase you know sort of brain drain from the organization how do we keep people um involved in this area 
and other sort of organizational contexts, sort of other themes of work. Um, you know, there's there's been a growing interest over the last decade or so in sort of chemical safety and security as, as part of the, the work of the OPCW, of course, there's the big themes around non-state actors and chemical uh, terrorism. Um, and of course, as well, I suppose, there's a bit of a move towards uh, what we might think of as interagency work as well. So capacity building amongst regimes and trying to work with other organizations. Um, and those all raise questions as well for, for what does that mean for the form and function of the OPCW moving forward and states parties will probably want to be thinking about that in the sort of next five years and 10 years. What does the organization look like um, to, to achieve what it wants to do? Um, and then looking more broadly again, science and technology, obviously a very important um, context for this organization. I suppose the Chemical Weapons Convention at its heart is a treaty about controlling technology and, and, and weaving science into that. Um, so there is a, a large component of reviewing science and technology relevant to the CWC, which will happen at the review conference. But that needs to be thought of internally. So what kind of technologies are the OPCW using for verification, for instance, or more broadly in their kind of processes, um, but also externally in the sort of threat environment, if you want to think of it that way, sort of how does evolving science and technology affecting what we're concerned about, what we're worried about. A good example of that, I guess, is benefits and challenges around artificial intelligence. You know, it's very complex to understand the sort of dual use aspects of that. Um, and then I suppose two other sort of final contexts. I mean, there may be more context, but just from a sort of opening uh, comments and the sort of normative or political context. So obviously following reports um, from the IIT on regard to, to the use of chemical weapons by um, Syria, um, there's a large question hanging over states parties about what do we do to strengthen norms, to strengthen implementation, to prevent the use of chemical weapons, but also questions around accountability. So that's also a sort of political context in which this uh, review conference will be happening in. And then just more broadly, uh, even further, you know, this, this is one review conference. Uh, there were four previously. The Chemical Weapons Convention is of unlimited length so we would hope and imagine there will be many more review conferences to come so i think there's also another context about what contribution do states parties what contribution do people want to make to this implementation to this organization to these kind of norms to this regime at this moment in time so i think people need to also kind of all of us need to, i think to keep that in mind um i think that's a kind of, i mean that's sort of five rough areas but maybe i'll pass back to you jamie on that Thank you, Alex. I think that's a really useful start, pointing some of the difficulties and challenges, but also there's glimmers of optimism there, I think, in terms of verification technologies, but also the destruction of declared stockpiles, which is a, which is a success. Perhaps I could turn to you now, um, Alexander, um, and really if you could talk us through sort of building on what Alex said, some of the some of the issues that are likely to emerge at the review conference. Um, I place the floor and screen. Yours. Thank you very, very much, Jamie, and a warm welcome to you all also from, from my side. I'd like to focus on, on three issue areas in, in particular, and uh, if you can spot uh, bits of repetition here, that, that is intended because obviously some of the contextual factors that uh, Jamie has uh, uh, asked Alex to speak about uh, will also uh, be reflected in, in the, the discussion of, of salient issues. And I would like to start with the uh, elephant uh, in, in the room, and that is the use of chemical weapons in, in Syria and elsewhere over the, the past few years. And here, the, the key issue is really that of uh, the, the, the question of identification of the perpetrators. And the IIT, the investigation and uh, identification team, which exists since the end of 2018 only, has already been mentioned. And that team within the technical secretariat of the OPCW in The Hague has recently released its third report in which it concluded that the Syrian armed forces had used chemical weapons in Duma. And that, that is sort of the state of affairs that, that presents itself to us. And the question is, what, what should one do with it or what should states parties do with it at the upcoming fifth CWC review conference this coming May? And I would argue that the issue here is one of mainstreaming. And let, let me explain that uh, a little bit. There, there is a view among 
several of the states' parties that the work of the IIT is focused only on the Syrian case. And while that is initially true, that's the, the raison d'etre so far, um, that's not the whole story because if you look at the decision that was taken in the summer of 2018, uh, it provides what I would uh, argue is the foundation for mainstreaming in its paragraphs 19 and 20. Now, these paragraph numbers is probably way more detailed than you want to know, but the key thing is that states' parties, if they feel the need to ask the technical secretariat for assistance in the investigation of a suspected or alleged use of chemical weapons, can use that decision of 2018 to go back to and say to the technical secretariat, please help us clear this up. And one of the key differences between that kind of work and what is traditionally subsumed under the investigation of alleged use, the way it has been written into the treaty text already many years ago, is that up to 2018, the organization was expected to only find out whether the use of chemical weapons had occurred, but not who the perpetrators were behind such use were. So that there is a fundamental change in the mandate of the organization that happened in the summer of 2018. And this change needs to be embedded more firmly in the overall verification work of the organization. And that's why I'm talking about the need to mainstream what this rather small and confined team of the IIT is currently doing for Syria into the larger context of the work of the organization. Now I'm already talking about verification here, verification of compliance uh, with the, the, the non-use norm. There are other elements to the verification system under the Chemical Weapons Convention, which the OPCW oversees and which it will need to continue to work on. There are abandoned chemical weapons, old chemical weapons that continue to surface uh, in different parts of the world, there are four holdout states which haven't signed or ratified or acceded to the Chemical Weapons Convention. And one or more of those four states may at some point in the future join the organization as a possessor state. So there is a clear need for the secretariat of the organization to remain the expertise to deal with such a scenario. And lastly, in the verification context, the industry verification system also remains important. For those of you who don't deal in OPCW matters on a daily basis, you can think of the routine verification activities of the organization basically in two parts. One is the chemical weapons related bit and reference was already made to that by my colleagues. That will come to an end. Declared stockpiles will be completed, that destruction will be completed later this year, but the industry verification bit to create this compliance that nobody among the state's parties is misusing industrial facilities to produce clandestinely chemical weapons, uh, that will go on. Again, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned the convention is of unlimited duration, so this industry verification regime uh, will also continue to be implemented as long as the con convention uh, is, is uh, open for business, so to speak. And that because of changes in chemical industry and science and technology advances, this system will need adaptation. Last but certainly not least, I would also talk for a brief moment about international cooperation and assistance activities under the convention. Mm -hmm. Now, while this is primarily, obviously, a security treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention, there are elements to it that focus more on international cooperation in the peaceful uses, assistance in case uh, somebody is threatened by the use of chemical weapons. So this whole international cooperation and assistance area uh, is, is a rather wide field, one, one has to say, and also a field of somewhat uneven implementation. 
So when you look at, for example, the obligation for states parties to implement the provisions, the obligations under the treaty at the national level, there are still quite a few significant gaps in terms of national implementing legislation and not only having the legislation in place on paper, but then actually following up with implementation activities. So this is one of the areas that needs further attention and where it would really be good if an additional impetus could be coming out of the review conference. And lastly, um, in the area of assistance and protection, the um, issue has uh, increasingly uh, been focused on uh, the threat of use or the actual use of chemical weapons by non-state actors such as terrorists. And that, again, uh, to pick up uh, sort of one of the, the, the key terms that has been floating around in this area, is where we have seen a growth in activities related to chemical safety and security, where the organization uh, in The Hague can play a very useful role uh, in supporting its uh, states' parties around the globe. And that should be enough for me. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you, Alexander. I, you also touch upon some of the questions that have been raised in the Q&A function online as well, which we'll get to shortly. And I'd encourage people, please do continue to submit those because we will get there. But before that, though, I want to offer the floor to my colleague, Maria. And if you could walk us through some of the recommendations in the report, um, please, the floor and screen are yours. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, Good afternoon and thank you all for coming again uh, and those of you online as well. Uh, thank you to my colleagues for that overview, which is in fact very relevant to the recommendations because they are of course all linked to these issues that we have been discussing um, during the, the previous minutes. Um, so the recommendations we do, there are 10 recommendations, specific recommendations in the report. Um, they're not exhaustive, of course. There are more issues uh, that could have been included, though. So I just wanted to, to make sure to say that. Uh, but in broad terms, these recommendations refer to two issues. So one would be the process of preparations to get to the review conference. And the other set would be on specific topics or issues uh, that we, as we just heard, we think are relevant that uh, could be productive to be discussed or could be relevant or are relevant to be discussed. So I'm not going to go into detail into all of this, uh, but provide an overview and hopefully tying together some of the, the, the issues that we have discussed. So this review conference um, is actually shorter than the ones we had before. So it will only be five working days. This is important, we previously had eight, 10 days. So there will be a very short time to get things done. So our first recommendation is to start preparations as early as possible. Um, and this can be done in different fronts. So states have, of course, their internal preparations, all of the consultations that they need to make within their agencies, within um, the different uh, stakeholders in their country to gather the information, gather their positions, and take that forward. Um, apart from that, there's preparation needed, of course, within the office holders of the review conference and the technical secretariat. And in particular, uh, what we highlight here is that they will be better placed in those five days if there are draft contingency plans beforehand. So, it's important to kind of map what will be the procedural issues that might come up and also the substantive issues that might come up. But what are the uh, linkages between the issues that will be done? Um, so all of those things that will be key in the negotiations during those five days. Um, and also be prepared to have already in their back pocket different options. Uh, so you have option A, which would be the ideal outcome that they would want. And then you also have prepared options B, option C, option Z. So uh, all of that has to be done beforehand, of course. Um, linked to that uh, is that these efforts in preparation 
um, of course, it, it's important that more opportunities to meet, to discuss, to debate are being uh, held before the review conference itself, following the work of the OEWG, of the open-ended working group uh, of the OpenCW. Uh, some of these meetings happen within the OpenCW, uh, such as those, and then we have others that happen outside that are organized by other stakeholders. Those are very important too. We have, for example, the Wilton Park meetings, etc. We also heard uh, one of the recommendations is actually that an ambassadorial retreat would be very helpful in uh, you know, having those uh, discussions and, and gathering inputs and, and drafting um, a way forward. Uh, and this is actually something that is going to happen. So that's, um, that's a good thing. Um, in all of these meetings, one of the things that we highlight is that it's important to have the voices of all state parties heard. So all of these meetings um, aiming to be as open and um, inclusive as possible. Um, in informal consultations that happen before and during the review conference, uh, of course, these are, these are normal processes, but as much as possible, it's good to avoid that dynamics that can happen of having an in-group and then an out-group of states parties that are supposedly more interested uh, than others in certain topics. Um, in that regard of, of inclusion, we think that also moving forward in the next intersessional process, it would be good uh, to strengthen this, uh, this process, but perhaps adopting more hybrid options for meetings. Uh, this has already been implemented, of course, we've all been through uh, COVID-19. Um, so the Scientific Advisory Board of the organization and also the open-ended working group, the OEWG, have had hybrid meetings. So taking this forward would be beneficial to involve more voices from all over the world uh, that otherwise might have it difficult to be involved in meetings in person in the Hay due to financial or time constraints, etc. Um, as I said, there are another set of recommendations that touch upon specific topics. Um, I'm not going to go into detail uh, about those because we just heard them, but basically it's the strengthening of links with industry and civil society. Uh, proper effective implementation of the convention cannot be done without them. Um, international cooperation and assistance, of course, as a key aspect to be discussed and the importance of safety and security issues uh, to, to drive consensus perhaps in that area. Also the future of the verification regime, as we just heard, uh, keeping uh, the organization as a repository of knowledge and expertise on chemical weapons, and also uh, setting in motion a process perhaps to review the industry verification. Um, other topics that we highlight have to do more with organizational issues. So reviewing the organization's tenure policy, for example, establishing a process perhaps to, to review it at this moment. There's also a new issue coming up in this review conference, which is the new uh, center for um, the new Chemtech Center uh, that has been established. And so states parties need to provide guidance on the activities of the center and also on on a sustainable funding for its activities. Um, and finally, there's a cross-cutting issue of gender equality, which we highlight. Um, so supporting gender equality in technical and policy discussions, keeping in mind gender equality in the configuration of uh, the, the delegations to the conference, of course, and in the conference itself, supporting the initiatives that combat gender stereotypes, that promote diversity, and also particularly developing assistance programs that have gender per perspectives embedded without, within them. Um, 
So to close, I would say, of course, we, we call this report preparing for success at the conference. So we might want to think about what success means. Um, it might take different forms. You would have an ideal outcome, but then success can also take different forms and it will mean different things to different people, to different delegations. I want to say that the lack of consensus in this, within the CWC, within the OBCW is not a new problem. So perhaps um, positive up outcomes can look different than a consensus. Um, well, this is what we want to strive for. Um, in, in this report, we present different options, different po potential outcomes of the review conference. And one of them, uh, the outcome number three, it states that it's possible for states parties perhaps to provide guidance on specific issues that uh, might be relevant in the next five years for the convention and the organization. So I'll leave it to that and hand over back to you, Jamie. Okay, thank you, Maria. I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. It, it was encouraging to hear yesterday that some of these preparatory activities are already going ahead. So I think that was good. And just a note on the gender issue as well. The gender and, and sort of equality and meaningful agency and participation, I think, is one key aspect to that. I think something else worth keeping in mind is that a, a chemical weapons attack is going to be pretty awful for all those on the receiving end of a chemical weapon, um, without a doubt. At the same time, it may not be equally awful. There could be gender differences in the consequences of a chemical attack between men and women, between boys and girls. And I think that's something to take into consideration the, the preparation, the provision of assistance um, through the, the convention as well. So it's an important area. I think it's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, we'll perhaps come on to some of the options and the outcomes, uh, the discussion. Uh, I, I think at one point you said option Z was one of them. I hope we don't get to that sort of backup plan Z would, would not be ideal. Uh, but for now, though, I'd like to move to the uh, Q&A section. I have three questions submitted online, but perhaps I can offer the floor to those of you in person. If anybody would like to raise any questions, we can bring you a microphone and the floor is yours. If not, I'll proceed to online questions. OK. Right, so I have three lined up um, here for you folks. Uh, the, the first one, and I hope those people online will forgive me for, for using their first names. Um, if you're happy for me to read your full names out, I'm happy to do so. Uh, but a question's for, questions from uh, Sven, who will be participating um, in the review conference as a civil society organization. They're particularly interested in recommendations and work around the use of right control agents. Um, and the exclusion of certain chemicals from the right control agent list. Are you aware of whether this is going to be addressed at the fifth review conference? And could you provide advice to civil society actors on how to be effective participants at the fifth review conference? Which is a really interesting question. Um, uh, do you want me to give you a couple of these and then you can, does anybody want to take this straight away? Okay. Another question from uh, Richard Guthrie of CBW Events, um, and this is a question really directed to you, Dr. Keller, and it's related to the IIT. Uh, isn't the underlying point of the Chemical Weapons Convention, like all treaties, that it embodies major concerns of the negotiators at the time? And so the investigation mechanisms of the chemical, we the chemical Weapons Convention reflects the experiences of the sorts of investigations that would be useful in the Iran-Iraq war. So isn't the key part of the review conference to keep the operations of the convention up to date and to be able to keep the tools available to OPCW so they're appropriate to use in contemporary circumstances? It's quite a long question, but thank, thank you both for, for those submitting those online. Does anybody want to start with either of those at all? Maria, are you? All right, so. Um, well, in terms of the, the riot control, I'm not, it's not a topic area which I can provide a lot of detail on in and of itself, but in terms of it coming up at the review conference, I think a first step for an NGO certainly is to speak with the sort of umbrella NGO um, group, the Chemical Weapons Convention Coalition. And I think that's one starting point for um, finding other like-minded NGOs, defining what sort of issues 
how we might want to frame those issues um, and trying to work out what might be possible in terms of presenting that issue or, or how we want to kind of proceed with it. Um, I think that's that's perhaps a useful way to move forward on it. In terms of the actual substance of the issue, I don't know if, if Alex, you have any insights into, into that more so. Not, not really, no. I mean, uh, there have been a couple of instances in the past where the use of riot control agents or what was described as a riot control agent has caused a few problems. And so I think it is very important to be very specific which chemical agents one is talking about because riot controls uh, riot control agents excuse me do not fall under the scope of the convention unless they are used as a method of warfare so use of a riot control agent in a police situation in a policing situation which would clearly not qualify as the, with their use as a method of warfare would be exempt from consideration by the OPCW and at the CWC review conference in any case. Now, as I said, there is a bit of a gray area and the scientific advisory board of the organization in the past has been tasked to look into these various chemicals and has expressed its opinions, which to me as, as a non-chemist uh, are um, sort of uh, look, look solid and look sound and well-reasoned and, and, and all that. But getting these then translated into political activities at the level of the organization or the states parties is sort of then a next step that will will need to be taken and what might be useful for the uh, person raising the question is to look at the decision that was taken at one of the more recent regular sessions of the conference of states parties concerning so-called cns central nervous system acting chemicals and the understanding, uh, the interpretation of the provisions of the Chemical Weapons Convention that states parties have expressed in that particular decision. Again, this is not looking at riot control agents specifically, but it is a related class of chemical agents, and it is a bit of a, a sort of a gray area, and we're really sort of looking uh, into chemical compounds here, which are at the margins of the major concern or the, 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 the major known chemical warfare agents that have been produced in large numbers during the Cold War mostly, and which over the past 25 years have almost completely now been destroyed under international verification. So this is this question about RCAs is important, but it is not concerning the core business of the organization if you look at the past 25 years of treaty implementation. Now, as I have the floor, sh shall I just Thanks, continue uh, on with the IIT question, which our dear colleague Richard Guthrie was so kind to, to raise? He's absolutely right that any treaty reflects the concerns of the negotiators at the time of negotiation. However, I think it would be a completely wrong conclusion, and I'm not saying that Richard is drawing this conclusion, far from it, uh, to say that as science and technology, as the geopolitical context moves on and changes over time, that treaty becomes irrelevant. And I would like to make one sort of general argument why why that would be a faulty assumption and, and also come back to a specific point I've already mentioned. The generic argument is that the Chemical Weapons Convention in its Article 2 contains what many people refer to as the general purpose criterion. So the prohibition of chemical weapons in this treaty works roughly along the lines that all toxic chemicals are prohibited. Now, that would be a bit 
going a bit too far if we would end here. Uh, so it then starts to make exemptions from this general prohibition of the use of toxic chemicals. First of all, it has to be toxic chemicals that are used to harm, to permanently incapacitate or to kill humans and, or animals. And uh, also uh, certain types of activities in industry, in pharmacy, in other areas are also exempt. But the general prohibition, the scope is extremely broad and it is of unlimited duration. So it is a generic prohibition. And then the drafters of the treaty, because they wouldn't know what the future will hold in terms of industry developments, in terms of S&T developments, in terms of future use scenarios for toxic chemical agents, uh, they wrote into Article 2 of this uh, treaty uh, this clause, which is referred to as the general purpose criterion, which says all toxic chemicals are prohibited unless uh, well, unless they are exempt in Article 6, which is sort of the uh, um, permitted uses clause. And if they are used or produced in types and quantities that have a justification, let's say for prophylactic purposes, because defenses against chemical weapons, of course, are permitted under the treaty. No, no state would sign up to a treaty that would uh, prohibit itself from, from defending against chemical uh, weapons. So there is this very broad scope, this very generic prohibition of toxic chemicals whenever they are intended to harm, uh, incapacitate or kill humans or animals. And there is updating the implementation, which was sort of the, the, the core of the, the question really, is going on. It is going on in small incremental bits during the implementation of the treaty. It has been going on uh, for the past 25 years and a more significant, a more easily visible update is the decision of the summer of 2018 that I have already referred to in my introductory remarks in the olden days, so to speak, when the CWC was negotiated, the assumption was interstate warfare, Cold War type scenarios, huge arsenals of chemical weapons being available to the uh, warring state parties. And so the question of identifying a potential perpetrator simply didn't enter the, uh, the the minds of the negotiators because the assumption under the in the context of the east west conflict the cold war was well it will be pretty obvious who the user of a uh, toxic chemical on such a large scale on the battlefield would have been but with the changing use scenarios over time the uh, advent of uh, assassinations with toxic chemical compounds uh, the advent of chemical terrorism Clearly, the use scenarios have changed over time. And so this question uh, of who done it actually became relevant because the use is much smaller scale and uh, the actors involved are much less clearly visible than the assumptions of the negotiators were in the olden days. So, yes, the person asking the question is perfectly right. Uh, implementation needs to be updated. But that is happening. So I think we're in both on the generic prohibition level, but also in terms of actual implementation, we're actually in, in fairly good shape, provided that this new obligation to identify can be maintained and can be mainstreamed, as I was arguing earlier, into the standard modus of uh, operation of the organization. Thank you very much. I think that's really useful, both raising the point on... <clears throat> on use scenarios, but also the comprehensive scope of the convention is much appreciated. Um, um, I, yeah, oh, sorry. So it's I have a kind of a follow up to that um, advice for NGOs on effective um, participation during, during the RevCon, um, following up on what, what, what you said, Alex. I think that's important to, to highlight that, uh, of course, NGOs at the review conference, they get 
you know, those corridor chats, which are always important, but they do not get to be in the closed meetings or, or, or decide or vote. So uh, to me, the most important thing for effective participation of experts, of NGOs, of civil society in general during the review conference is actually putting the ideas forward beforehand. So making a plan. Um, with enough st enough time for states and, and, and delegates to process those ideas. Uh, so provide opportunities to discuss this, uh, make a plan on how you're going to disseminate your work or your ideas um, and, and, and how you're going to present them to get it to the right people uh, with time for them to process them. And then they are the ones that are going to make the call. So yeah, just, I, I wanted to, to highlight uh, that point. No, thank you, Maria. I think it's really useful <laughs> to raise this. Then I would echo as well. Um, I, I have a couple more questions now. Sorry, please. Shall we bring you a microphone? In fact, the, the gentleman behind you actually has a microphone. He's bringing it to you. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a bit of an outsider, but um, my question is, um, what do you hold? How does all this relate to what is happening in Iran, where um, schoolgirls are being poisoned? In school? <clears throat> I, I think somewhere it's not really chemical weapon, but I, I feel that it, it has something to do with this problem. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps I could address that. Thank you for the question, first of all. And it's obviously something which from the reports that we hear and see, this is something really quite troubling. And from our side, we're aware of several reports referring to, to school girls in, in Iran reportedly being treated for poisoning. Um, I think some numbers have been estimated as being up to a thousand students uh, that have been targeted and subsequently suffered respiratory problems, nausea, dizziness, and various other um, health effects. I, I, my understanding is that there is some sort of investigation being undertaken into this at the moment internally, but I, I don't, that's only from, from the uh, press material that I have. And there's obviously a lot of speculation around what's happening and who's responsible. And if, if this, what, just try and make sense of it. I think just before handing the, the floor to my colleagues, I would note that from our side, it's very hard to draw any firm conclusions on the basis of the, the information that is available to us, and I suspect to many other states as well, if I can speak for states. Um, what we can say, I think, this we, we collectively on this panel, and I suspect in this room, would, would strongly condemn the use of chemical weapons by anybody at, at any time. And I hope we can find ways to hold anybody responsible, if that is the case, but accountable for the use of these weapons. At the same time, it, it's really kind of a, a difficult situation because there is a real lack of information, I think, that is um, that we can use for this. But thank you for raising it. I think it's a really important question. Gender issue, not yeah. yeah. No, thank you for raising it. It's important. I don't know whether anybody would like to add. Alexander, please. Yes, just perhaps to add, uh, it's more like a, a footnote uh, to add. Uh, from the perspective of the the OPCW, of, of which I was a staff member uh, until a few years ago, but I'm I just want to make clear I'm not speaking on behalf of the organization. As as uh, Jamie said at the outset, we're all here in our personal capacity. But um, also, when when I was there, um, reports like the ones you have now referred to uh, about these poisonings. Uh, from time to time have popped up and and the question also in in my personal environment friends and family have asked me why isn't your organization doing more or why why isn't your organization doing anything in in, in that regard that that we are uh, aware of and i think that there are two parts to to the answer of of, of that question. One is, uh, I think we can all rest assured that the OPCW Technical Secretariat is closely monitoring uh, this, this situation and, and, and these reports. But uh, if you recall, I, I, I mentioned investigations of alleged use uh, in an earlier comment I made. Um, it is not that this organization can go around like a policeman and say, oh, we've heard something is wrong here and we'll investigate now. <clears throat> this is not how the system has been set up. It is always down to one or more states parties to ask the organization to become active. And this can take a number of forms. If, if you think back a few years uh, to the uh, uh, Salisbury uh, poisoning, uh, that that uh, you, you all will will be aware of. 
the form this took back then was that the British government asked the organization, could you please dispatch a technical assistance visit to confirm or disconfirm what we think we have found out? There is also, if uh, somebody concludes that, and I'm not talking about the Iran case now in particular, but more generically, that something is going amiss, that somebody has used chemical warfare agents somewhere, uh, a investigation of alleged use can be brought to the organization. And then the director general of the OPCW needs to, to start a process rolling that is clearly spelled out. But the OPCW and its technical secretariat, that's not like the sheriff in a Wild West situation uh, that one could imagine that can become active uh, on, on, on its own uh, motivation. So there needs to be a trigger that always comes from one of the 193 states parties for the secretariat to support and to, to assist or to investigate. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Did anybody else wish to take the floor, please, madam? I believe it's a, if we could bring, I believe it's an Anita at the microphone, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Aristi Bonaldi. I'm a journalist, and uh, I would like to know if there is any sanction that will be uh, implemented if anything uh, really duly uh, checked has been revealed. And in such case, what would be the sanction, if any, and who would be um, implementing the sanction on what, which international legal basis? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think as a, as a generic sort of question, I think there are a number of different forms of sanction that could be implied, whether it's through the UN, through the European Union, or states may have individual sanctions they may, may wish to apply as well. But perhaps I could turn to one of our panelists to address that question, um, in sort of generic sanctioning opportunities, perhaps. Um, well, I, again, sanctions isn't something I know a huge amount about, but I suppose the first question would be, what what is it that they find out? who are we actually assuming is 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 behind these attacks so i think depending on the outcome of identification of what the agent was and who has used it that would be i guess a first starting point to help us identify what sort of sanctions are we talking about state entities are we talking about non-state actors and i think that's the kind of as a sort of generic first step in this uh where, where i would think um i'm sure other people can can speak in slightly more detail but in terms of what the OPCW itself would do, um, I'm sure I, th I think it would pass it f further up the chain to the United Nations and to the Security Council. I, I think that would probably be the logical step, unless you, you can think of any, either of you. No, I, I just want to highlight as well in, the, in following what you're saying, that any of these processes in the international level take time. So it's quite rare to see an immediate action taking place because there are a lot of steps, a lot of politics, a lot, a lot of things that are involved um, that may not be immediately obvious to the general public, but it's the path that international law and in the international community follows. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. So. Well, I, I think the uh, case of chemical weapons use in, in Syria and, and how the organization has reacted to that uh, might be also instructive in, in this regard, because there it was clearly determined that parts of the state apparatus, parts of the, the armed forces of, uh, of the Syrian government uh, had used chemical weapons against the population in, in certain cities. At, at various points in, in time. And what that has then shown is sort of the limited set of options that are available to the states parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention in quote unquote, punishing a perpetrator. And that has to do again with the overall setup with the logic underlying a treaty like the Chemical Weapons Convention. Because you need to keep in mind that states parties accede freely to an international agreement like that. 
So they do this usually because they expect everybody else to comply with the rules and the obligations that are written down in this treaty, as they are themselves expected to have national implementing legislation, to allow inspections if they have certain types of chemical industry facilities, and all the other obligations that, that go along with treaty membership and membership in an organization like the OPCW. So the whole design is not one where you would expect misbehavior, violations of the general rules that everybody has agreed once or in the at the moment they, they signed up to the treaty in the first instance. So that's why the, 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 the toolbox, if you want to, when it comes to sanctioning misbehavior is rather limited for an organization like the OPCW. And what has happened in the case of Syria to come sort of perhaps in a bit of a long winded way back to, to, to my starting point here is that the Syrian representatives at the OPCW, the Syrian government was sort of stripped of some of its rights and obligations under the treaty. So for example, whenever there is a vote and reference was already made to the fact that not all decisions in the recent past at the OPCW have been taken by consensus. So there was voting. And so this is, is, is a relevant right of a state party to take part in, in voting whenever something substantial needs to be decided and there is no consensus and, and, and the vote is called. So the Syrians can't at the moment take part in any of the votes uh, that uh, are called at, at the OPCW. They still have the right to, to speak at meetings and, 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 and make their positions known, but whenever it comes to a vote, uh, they, they are excluded unless it has been determined that they are again in full compliance with their obligations under the treaty. Now, this is in case of a state party which has been found to have used chemical weapons. I'm not saying that anything of that sort is, is, is happening or has happened in, in Iran or elsewhere at the moment, just to give you a, a sense of the, the options that are in principle available and how they have been made use of in the case of another state party. Thanks, Alexander. Anita, if I may, and perhaps Sarah, our producer, perhaps you could put this online, a link to the uh, Ralph Trapp and Chen Tang paper report which actually does talk about sanctions here, it's in 5.2, and I'm happy to give you a copy of this. But I think that the point being that, as uh, Dr. Keller has pointed out, there's a range of possible tools to address um, violations of the convention once, once proven. Uh, but yeah, I'll stop there because we have a couple of questions. And I'm also conscious, uh, Raphael, who, who has been waiting very patiently online, has submitted a number of questions which I'd, I'd like to get to. Um, in addition to asking you all for your comments on, on the outcomes bit as well. So, I mean, what would you think will actually happen? Uh, Raphael has asked, um, and apologies because I'm sort of trying to synthesize these, Raphael, but there's a, a question related to industry actors. Um, so in the sense that some of these are perhaps been sidelined, but could you elaborate on the relationship between industry? And then the question related to how can we avoid smuggling that takes place in terms of chemical materials? And this is obviously a major concern to the international community. So how do you address some of those, those issues with, with that sort of thing? I suppose you could expand that as well, sort of given technological change, how, how do you address intangible issues as well? But that's perhaps a step too far. So there's a question on industry linkage as uh, smuggling and then outcomes, which is a quite a lot to be going with. Does anybody want to start off with any of those? Um, well, I guess I could just um, open up the discussion of our industry actors. So I think uh, perhaps we start from a false premise if we think that trying to connect with industry is something we need to be doing because actually historically um, industry was a very important um, component of the negotiations. Um, and is obviously a key actor in facilitating the, the industry verification, you know, without the buy-in to varying degrees of industry, um, it's very difficult to put inspectors inside private property of um, chemical plants around the world and looking through things and, and um, you know, going through the documents and seeing what's there. So I think, I think a good starting point is that industry does need to, to, to kind of be at the table and has been in the past. I think what the question might 
be uh, well certainly raises that is that the nature of that relationship has has um been up and down i think over the duration of the sort of 25 26 years um i think in the sort of middle part or early part of the opcw perhaps that relationship um waned a little bit um but my understanding is um in the last five or six years there have been maybe slightly more than that now there have been efforts to to connect with industry to to kind of have joint initiatives to work with industry bodies um to to sort of facilitate input from industry and i think that that it, it's it's very important not just because it's good to speak to industry because we're verifying them but when we think about the organization evolving moving forward what does verification look like science and technology is evolving around us how do we make sure that verification practices are actually up to the job um, up to the task of verifying what's going on within these chemical plants mm -hmm. um, we need to speak to 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 um to industry so we understand what's going on with them as well so there has to be this discourse this dialogue um so that the opcw's verification sort of uh toolbox is is sort of appropriate for the job um i think that in my mind that's a kind of very brief kind of overview but for me yeah <clears throat> to summarize i think industry is a key actor in this and it it has been and i think we need to work hard state parties need to work hard to to ensure the health of that relationship because we shouldn't assume that industry is sort of you know that that relationship is always going to be healthy it takes work yeah thanks Alex I think that's a really useful point and I'd, I'd, I'd echo it I don't think it'd be possible to manage the challenge of dual use chemistry without that industry partnership uh I could see both uh, perhaps Maria do you want to go first then yeah, I'm to just glad to to what Alex was saying and mm. sort of to that big picture that you painted and and the importance of industry for those also strategic issues um there's also the other side of the coin which is the the relationship with uh, industries within each country and that is uh, managed uh, mainly by national authorities so the institutions within each country that are assigned the the <laughs> the um they're managing uh, the convention issues uh, within each country so I think that having worked in the national authority and speaking from from that experience, the relationship with industry it's very important because, as as Alex said, they are the ones opening the doors to to the verification. Um, and it's very interesting uh, and I think important the, the efforts that can be done in education and outreach to these actors. If you start with education uh, from uh, uh, the 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 form when, when these professionals form themselves in university, then they go to work in industries. They know about the convention. They have at least an idea that this exists, which is not always the case. Um, it's usually the case that you um, have a meeting, you call. <laughs> uh the industries and and they say oh no we don't do chemical weapons we have nothing to do with that um and that of course is false because they have everything to do with that as Jamie said uh, the challenges of dual use and and other challenges uh, they have a lot to do with that so education and outreach efforts that are made not only by the organization, mm -hmm. but also by the national authorities within each country are crucial in engaging the industry actors um, in that regard. Thanks, Maria. I think that's a really useful point. Thank you for raising it. And I think education and outreach more generally, including to academia, I think is something where there's been quite a lot of work done in, in the development of codes of conduct and things. It's been a, a sort of push in this area, which is really useful, but I think it's still an area where more and more sustainable work will need to continue. Um, Alexander, there was a couple of questions I think I had on my list. Um, industry smuggling outcomes. Um, if you want to take any of those or anybody else wants to follow up. If people do have other questions, please do let me know. Um, and similarly online, um, please do submit your questions and we'll try and get to those. Uh, please, Alexander. Yes, thank you. Um, just perhaps a, a tiny uh, addition to the uh, relationship between industry and, and OPCW. And Alex already mentioned that this had its up and downs. But uh, over the past few years, the relationship, I would say, has been fairly stable. And 
uh, more formalized, <clears throat> there is uh, what I think is called a chem chemical industry coordination group, CICG, that is meeting regularly once or twice a year uh, under the uh, purview of the executive council of the organization. There are regular industry cluster meetings. So industry representatives are <clears throat> regularly involved uh, and, and, and are regularly exchanging views uh, with the uh, OPCW uh, leadership, with OPCW staff, with state party representatives. And that concerns not only the chemical producers, but also the uh, Chemical Trade Association, which uh, has also been brought into the fold, uh, so to, to speak. And that perhaps is uh, a way to get from one question to the other, because uh, obviously, um, yeah, smuggling would be sort of uh, a trade uh, without sort of following the regular channels of, uh, of, of trade, one, one might perhaps say. And uh, here the uh, um, yeah uh, major uh, the major uh, responsibility I would argue is clearly uh, in the area of states parties because um, they have to make sure that in their area of jurisdiction the provisions of the treaty are implemented and one of the key prohibitions in Article 1 of the Chemical Weapons Convention is the prohibition of transferring chemical weapons, and by extension also precursor chemicals that may end up in, in, in chemical weapons. So in a sense, uh, it is up to the states' parties to ensure that their border controls, their export controls, are up to scratch and are capable of actually giving life to this obligation that they have undertaken under the treaty. Now, I don't want to get into intangible uh, technology transfers, really, just to say that, obviously, if you think about it only for a moment, this is a lot more difficult than tangible uh, transfers, where you have an actual shipment taking place that you can intercept at a physical border. Uh, and uh, just just leave it at that, because I think that is opening uh, a whole can of worms that we probably don't want to get into right now. Uh, let me perhaps uh, then uh, start our discussion on, on outcomes. As, as you may have spotted, if you have browsed through the uh, uh, publication uh, already, we are uh, yeah, putting out five different scenarios, what we call scenarios and don't really fully develop those, just try to highlight uh, some of the uh, advantages or, or disadvantages we, we see and also uh, discuss a tiny bit uh, what, what we would regard as a more likely or less likely outcome. And there, uh, the outcome number three, uh, at least in, in the discussion we had uh, yesterday in, in, in The Hague presenting our report there, has uh, yeah uh, attracted uh, quite quite a bit of attention, and that is the the option of a chairperson report with discrete decisions being taken by the review conference. Now the ideal scenario, we I guess we we all agree. Certainly we here on the panel are in in, in agreement. The ideal outcome of such a review conference would be a strategically oriented substantive document that provides guidance to the organization for the next five years at least and has been adopted or will be adopted by consensus. So that's the ideal case scenario. And when you think back to the first comments that were made from this panel from by my colleague about the geostrategic and the other contexts we are dealing with, we unfortunately had to conclude for, for ourselves in, in our discussions uh, as an author team that this is uh, probably not the most likely outcome, to put it mildly. And so uh, we, we were wondering whether a replay of the outcome of the previous review conference, which is a chairperson's report, uh, combined with decisions on specific areas which are clearly self-contained issues in their own right. Something like 
the agreement that exists on fighting uh, non-state actor use uh, of chemical weapons by terrorist groups or terrorist actors, or the need to have uh, strategic guidance and a solid funding for the new Center for Chemistry and Technology, the Chemtech Center that has been mentioned. Whether issues like those, if our suspicion is correct that an overall consensus on the interpretation of the past five years and an outlook for the next five years cannot be achieved, whether that might be a viable option to gain as much from this upcoming review conference as, as one possibly can. Because if you have just a chairperson's report, as we had at RC4, that can reflect the discussions that took place. But it, in a way, is just the interpretation of or the view of the chairperson of the review conference. It is not a clear guidance given by all states parties on any particular issue. And so as a compromise solution, we were just wondering, and well, we actually have thrown this into, into the uh, debate uh, with our publication for states parties and outside observers, perhaps to give this option uh, a, a bit more thought, uh, because we, we felt that this might be a better solution than either a watered down version of the text, which everybody can live with as an outcome document, but which then might be devoid or largely devoid of meaningful substance, not providing enough strategic guidance, or to retain, try to retain a uh, substantive document and vote on it. And we, we, the feedback we've gotten so far doesn't suggest that anybody in The Hague is, is really interested mm -hmm. in voting on an outcome document. So we have this in there as, as one of the less desirable options, but uh, quite clearly, um, we haven't encountered anybody so far who has strongly advocated voting, to put it that way. Thank you, Alexander. The point on division of labor between the OPCW and states, I think, is really important, as well as the, the outcome three and the discussion around that. I'd be interested to get people's views on that online or in person on that. Um, but I think also, uh, Alex, did you want to take the floor? Or Maria, did you want to follow up on that? My... Uh... I was actually hinting, talking about industry still, but you've you've moved you've moved on <laughs> rapidly. Sorry but about that. <laughs> no, um, I mean maybe it's just worth uh, saying what I was going to say, which was only um, just a very brief point. But when we're talking about industry, you know, I, I was talking about the engagement with the organisation. But I think it's also really important to remember that um, it to take a bigger picture on on industry that when we think about what the OPCW is doing at the moment, what sort of work it's doing questions around chemical safety and security, um, questions around guarding against non-state actors uh, and chemical terrorism. Um, you mentioned the sort of broader scope of what a chemical weapon is. It's not just these kind of traditional concepts of sarin or uh, cold war sort of nerve agents. It can be any, any chemical. So thinking about toxic industrial chemicals, chlorine, things like this, industry is very much part of this story. So um you know there's the kind of question around the sort of politics of it and how they're engaging with the opcw but there's also the broader thing that these are actors which need to be engaged because if we are going to roll back on uh you know chemical terrorism non-state actors um improving security around the industry and trade um you know industry is key in this um so we ignore them at our peril that's what i was going to say um, now I've forgotten what you wanted me to s talk about. No, no, that's fine. You've said it now anyway. Uh, that's the claim. Um, oh, no. I, yeah. So you right. just yeah. about the outcome three. Um, I think there's also a key pointer, which is maybe different from when we think of the Biological Weapons Convention. The OPCW, the Chemical Weapons Convention, we, we have a 500 person organization which is doing day to day work. When we think of the BWC, this is, is very different you know it's a very small is implementation support unit with i mean the, the tasks are not comparable so when we're thinking about a review conference yes there are these kind of big issues which will not get consensus at the minute but there is also a real need to be clear about some of the programmatic work that the organization does need to do so after the review conference the technical secretariat will continue doing their work but having some guidance on very discrete issues which hopefully could build some consensus 
or move things forward like what do we do with the new um chem tech center that, that has been established i think that is absolutely crucial and, and that's why i think outcome three is a kind of a way to try and balance yeah we can't agree on the big strategic stuff but there might be space to get some consensus on some important threads of activity that the you know the day after the review conference people can say okay well, we've got this decision this is useful let's work on this and this um yeah yeah just to add to that i think that it's also worth uh, remembering in that train of thought that the last strategic guidance that was given in a review conference was in um, the third review conference so if we don't get anything um, or if we have like kind of the same outcome that in the review the fourth review conference we would have like 15 years of uh, states parties not being able to offer strategic guidance for the future of the organization um, and a lot has changed in 15 years already um, and will continue to change so um, I think that that is very important to keep in mind um, and just regarding this outcome three that we proposed that uh, you mentioned you both mentioned um, I think also it's a good balance between a conservative outcome that has already happened and sort of thinking outside the box of new things that could be added to that um, that might be helpful in providing strategic guidance as I said before but ultimately of course it's up to the states to to come up with whatever uh, solution works best for them um, not again not possible to decide in five days so this needs to be discussed beforehand thanks maria i think it's a really important point i think you only need to look at some of the background documentation on changes in science and technology and there is a, a report by the scientific advisory board on this topic but looking through that the the changes in terms of the risks but also the opportunities i think that that alone does require that sort of strategic guidance i think for moving forward with some of these issues um, I'm conscious of the time. Did anybody else here wish to take the floor at all? If not, I have one final question I put to my colleagues on the panel. I can't see anybody. I can't see anything within the questions online. So perhaps I can ask you for you it was sort of one or two minutes. Um, if you were to meet a chemical weapons convention focused genie offering you one wish, it's perhaps quite the most disappointing form of genie to meet, but uh, nonetheless, a genie offering you one wish, what would it be? And um, perhaps I can start with you, Alex. Uh, can we start the other way around? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I can go ahead. I think that, um, I, I don't know about the genie itself, but what, what I would want or, or the message that perhaps this publication uh, was meant to, to give is um, that in order to get some sort of outcome that is um, relevant, uh, you need to prepare for that success. Um, so we do hope that this publication helps uh, smaller delegations or delegates that have too many things on their plate um, to be better prepared um for the review conference in a couple of months um and and just keeping in mind that uh, preparations are key for any success and that states bodies will need to think about what are the key issues that they think are important in taking forward that that they would want to have outcomes and provide strategic guidance for the future of the organization on um just to say that and thank you again for for coming thank you maria um alexander please. well my my wish would be some somewhat related i guess um i've mentioned that the destruction of declared stockpiles of chemical weapons will come to an end later this year and that is really what has been driving this organization for the past 25 years. It was supposed to take uh, a much shorter period uh, to, to accomplish that goal. Well, it has taken as long as it has, has taken, so be it. But that point in time is now approaching. And sort of the uh, 
major rationale for the organization is disappearing with that set of activities, the verification of destruction of those declared stockpiles, uh, that, that is disappearing. And there was an effort uh, made that started a few years ago already to come up with a new unifying concept. And that was labeled preventing the re-emergence, which is only logical. Once you have destroyed all non-chemical weapons, uh, what you want to do with a convention that is of unlimited duration, you want to prevent the re-emergence of the weapons you have just finished destroying. So in, 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 in a way, uh, that is not sort of too too much out of sort of the, the the ordinary to come up with that idea i would argue and that thought that that body of work that went into that uh i find unfortunately has been lost sight of a little bit but no other unifying concept has emerged that that i could point to so if i had a, a cwc genie uh, at my disposal I would uh, try to suggest that this genie uh, plants the idea in people's minds to perhaps have another look at this concept of preventing the re-emergence and whether it might be useful to galvanize support for a unified strategic vision for the organization to move forward. And with that, now it's your turn. Um basically what they said no i i think i, I think what what is important is it, it does build on on that it's it's i think states parties need to take some time to think about what they actually want the opcw to be doing um and to go further on that there needs to be some open honest transparent reflections on the way in which the technical secretariat pursues the tasks it has to in terms of implementing that. So I would like further discussion on questions around tenure, on gender, on geographic representation, on how the, the technical secretariat itself can be as efficient and effective as, as possible. And there needs to be some creativity in that because the challenges that we'll face are starting to emerge, you know, as, as was raised by some questions in the back of the room, you know, with, with Iran, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And this, this is perhaps potentially a kind of future we're moving into where information is unclear, it's difficult, we don't know how to move forward on these things. So um, I think state parties need to have a, a, a think about how to achieve a technical secretariat which is is fit for purpose and actually works to implement the convention with state parties um i would also say as a kind of tag on to that can i get two little wishes because instead of a big wish um a little wish would be again for state parties to 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 look at national implementations look at the gaps look at how this convention is being implemented into national legislation and and look around and look at other state parties how can states help other states to to kind of um, build or improve or deepen their implementation what are the challenges that sort of knowledge sharing working together for the convention I think is something which we were kind of sorely in need of you know 26 years down the line um, I think I think the statistic was you know around 70 states parties have still not fully implemented it so there's a long way to go even though destruction is over Very thank you <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. I think that's a, a good note to conclude on. And indeed, we're actually about right on time. So I, I do just want to say some thank yous before we conclude. Um, firstly, thank you to Ms. Mace for joining us and the UK team for facilitating the process. Uh, I should point out that we want to thank all our funders for the work we do at Unidem. In the case of this specific project, I'd like to extend our gratitude to the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for providing support for the project, the report and the events. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to express my thanks to our panelists, uh, to Alex, um, Alexander and Maria. Thank you all for joining and taking the time. And also uh, behind the screens on, on the online version, we have my, my colleagues helping with the production. So thank you to Sarah and Shizuka uh, back in Geneva for your support in, in making the, the tech side of things work, as well as actually, I think it's Kevin at the back who's the, thank you. Um, uh, last but not least, thank you all for joining us here online and in person. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day and coming potentially through a protest to, to join us. It is greatly appreciated. Uh, thank you. If you would like further information on the report or the materials, it's available on our website. I think there's copies around and I think there's flyers you can use to, to access more there. 
just before I do close, I would encourage you as far as possible to, to provide us feedback on these events. So if you do have strong views, if there are things you think we should do better, we should do differently, it is helpful for us moving forward to get that information, to get your, your sort of feedback and your response so we can build and advance our events uh, for, the, for the future. So we do appreciate that. And it should be relatively painless and short filling that in. There's only a couple of questions. So I would encourage you and invite you to fill that in. Uh, um, with that, um, I think that's everything. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much.